somewhere between 10 and 15 Men's Health Symposium. We've been doing this for quite a long time. And it gets more and more fun every year. <laughs> yeah. Um, Dr. Goldberg and I started this a long time ago. And over the years, it's grown. And um, tonight, what I'm going to do is talk to you about, oh, we're going to talk to you about a topic that's dear to our heart. Speaker, are you? No, I think we're um, too close. reverberating. <laughs> Sorry, Tasha. Hey, we're too close. We're way too close. <laughs> well, that's true, we are. We're way too close. <laughs> we're going to talk to you about prostate cancer. Jonathan Zier, many of you know him. Greater Mankato Growth. He's been in this community for well over a decade, helping us grow, right? And a lot of what you're seeing in our community is thanks to Jonathan. and I are going to talk about something that we got to know together about two years ago. Two years ago, John came to see me about what we thought was a little problem. Jonathan? Yeah, at, uh, you know, at the age of 45, uh, I finally decided I should grow up and take responsibility for my life, and I should start having regular checkups with my family doctor, Carolyn Burt. And so at the age of 45, I started going. She did all the regular checkup stuff that you would do on bloods and everything else. And I had my first prostate exam at that time, or first prostate test, PSA, and a digital exam as well. And everything was fine. I had a 3.7 or a 3.9. Dr. James and I were disputing those numbers a minute ago. But nonetheless, it was a high three. And I, it didn't mean anything to me at that point. Next year, I went back, same thing. Um, numbers still were stable, the same. So good stable numbers seemed to be good. The third year, so this is the spring of 2013. Went in, still everything was the same. And Dr. Berg, after conducting the digital rectal exam, said, you know, I don't really feel anything. Your numbers, you know, 4.0 is sort of what in the medical field we use as a trigger point. And you've been below that. But here's the thing. You're a young guy with an elevated PSA. I'm not sure, and I really don't think I feel anything on the digital examination. And you have a father who was diagnosed with prostate cancer six years ago. So when you put all those things together, I just think you ought to see a colleague of mine so that we can be more definitive and make sure that this really isn't anything. So she introduced me to Dr. James about a month later. And we sat down in your office and reviewed all those same things. And we looked at the percentages of risks and what it might be. We said we, we probably ought to check into this further, do some diagnosis. Right, and, and so we did. There was some discussion about how and when to go about this because we had seen stability in his numbers. And his exam findings were, yeah, they weren't as clear cut as so many times they are. There are some men we examine and it's pretty clear there's a problem. The majority, I would say though, are less clear. And so we had a number that was stable at three, three and a half. He should really been less than two, under, under two, under one, a low number. But the stability misled us in a sense, because we thought, ah, no harm. So over a period of what turned out to be months, right, there were a few, it's real life, there were delays. Uh, well, Dr. James had said, uh, he said, here's the, uh, the diagnostic exam, right? It's a biopsy. Well, biopsy sounds pretty painless, right? I mean, needle through the skin. Well, then he had to remind me of the anatomy. <laughs> Where this little gland is buried and how you get to it. Never said it was painless. Yeah, and so he explains this exam to me that you've got to go through the rectum. And, you know, uh, I said, well, okay, um, so what, what are the after effects? And he said, well... He said, uh, you probably need a weekend to recover. So you're just going to want to rest and lay low. Now, um, I said, so is this a bag of peas type deal? Because I've had that one. And he said, yeah, it's a little like that, but not quite as bad. And he said, but you need to be around for a good 10 days. Because there is a very small risk that you can have a complication from this diagnostic exam. You might get sick. Right. And I said, well, this was... April, May, May, I think. Yeah. And I said, well, I, I'm going to uh, Europe next month on the governor's trade mission, so that's probably not a good idea. We shouldn't do it yet. No, don't And do when it. I get back from that, Ginger and I want to drive to Glacier. We've never been to Glacier National Park. We want to do that. So we're going to do that. <laughs> Dr. James is listening to my schedule. He says, hey, well, why don't you just enjoy summer? <laughs> and when you're done with summer, there's really no real hurry here. Uh, it, it's going to be fine. Don't worry about it. Let's wait till like September. 
and we'll do it when you're done playing golf and gallivanting. And so that's what we scheduled for, is we targeted for like the first Friday in September. But something happened. Yeah, then real life continued to be in the way, and as Ginger and I were on our trip to Glacier, her father, who had been battling cancer for a good eight years, um, took a turn for the worse, and by the time we got back, then we spent the next six weeks uh, dealing with his uh, difficulties and then ultimately his passing. And the very day I was supposed to have the diagnostic was the very day that we had his uh, memorial service. And so we had just, the timing was off, and by the time we could refine a time in my calendar and Dr. James's calendar where we had a good 10 day span. His schedule is busier than mine. Mm -hmm. We needed 10 days. I mean, so, we're, oh. yeah. Yeah. so we had to wait until November 1st. Yeah, it was and that's when we could conduct the diagnostic. Yeah, and so many of you are familiar with this. What we do is we look in the bladder many times to see what sort of obstruction there is, if there's obstruction to the urethra. And then we do an ultrasound guided needle biopsy. Some of these we do under anesthesia. We use all kinds of techniques to try and make it less painful. It's a little better today than it used to be a decade ago, but it's still very much the same. Um, we put numbing agents in the prostate and take samples. And so we did that mm -hmm. on a Friday. It was a Friday. Right. Yeah. On a Friday, and the weekend was, as he said, it was simply nearly wasn't as bad as my first experience with the bag of peas. So I did just fine, and by Monday the next week, I was back to normal activity, and um, there were some you know, residual types of things in terms of urination, et cetera, just some small things that, that were said would happen. And um, uh, it was uh, Tuesday, November 5th, 6th, 4 p.m. 2, 3, 4, 5, right. Well, 4.45 by the yeah, time you're the last sold. guy there. Yeah. <laughs> well, I knew that I'd gotten a phone call from Dr. James in the afternoon. Maybe it was three, I don't right. remember those times. And then there were two more calls from him, but no voicemail. But the first one was a voicemail, the next two weren't. First one said, give me a call. Um, next two, there was nothing. And at that point, of course, I knew, gee, my doctor's trying to reach me three times in the afternoon. I only had, there's something here, right? So I call him, I said, I've got my phone in front of me, I'm going into a meeting, when it rings, I'll step out and take your call. 4.45, he calls me, and I remember that call vividly. Right, so Dr. James is on the other end. And well, then we, we told you what you had. Yep. You know, said so that you had prostate cancer, yep. and that we needed to have, you know, a more thorough discussion of what you did and didn't have. Right, and that was a Tuesday, and so I, right away, I said, well, okay, I don't know a lot about cancer, right? But they talk about stages. Is this stage two, stage three? So where are we, right? The first thing I want to know is what is this? And he says, prostate cancer is a lot different than that, Jonathan. And he said, we'll talk about all that, but I'd really like to have you and Ginger come into the office and we can sit down and go through everything and we can talk about all the treatment options, et cetera. All good stuff, we just need to do that. Right, So and, yeah, and we did. And of course, the key is to have at least two people come along and hear it, it. It's amazing how when you have a conversation that the husband and wife, or however you want to look at it, they hear a different story. Same person talking. They hear nuance. They hear it, it's a different story. And together, uh, he'll forget things. She'll hear things. And together, the two of them are able to put together what I, pretty close to what I said. It's, it's remarkable. So we were going to meet. We were. A week. week later on right. Tuesday, we were going we to meet and have our conversation, the three of us. Except for what happened. Yeah, except for we went through the week, everything was fine, Ginger and I were traveling at the end of the week, we were in Rochester watching our goddaughter swim on Friday evening. Saturday we went to be with Ginger's mom, who was still grieving heavily from the loss of her husband and Ginger's dad. And we spent the day with her, and Saturday afternoon after we had lunch out of town, uh, we lived in a, her, she lived in a small town, Spring Valley, Minnesota, which is where Ginger and I grew up, some of you might know the area. Went and had lunch in, um, uh, where's the furniture store? Fountain. Fountain, yeah, we had lunch in Fountain. <laughs> and we drove back, and it's a 15 minute drive from Fountain to Spring Valley, I was really tired. It, this, those of you in the sleep one, drowsy when you're driving, I was experiencing that, which I thought, wow, this is just really strange. We got back, and so we had a few other conversations with Ginger's mother, and then we hit the road about 2 in the afternoon, and I said to Ginger, would you mind driving? She said, are you okay? I said, yeah, I'm fine. I'm just a little tired. I don't know why. And if you're awake, it, it's smart that you drive, not me. So we drove back, and I pretty much slept the entire way. And when I got home, I just wasn't feeling very well. I started to feel like I was having maybe the flu or something, and I had really forgotten that Dr. James said you need 10 days, right? 
because I'm on day eight, day nine, somewhere yeah. in there. And by 10 o'clock that night, I felt really bad um, and went to bed early. And um, by the time I woke up at 12, 30, 1 o'clock in the morning, uh, when I urinated, I had blood in my urine. So immediately I thought, okay, this isn't right. And then quickly the brain went back to, wait a minute, you had an exam a week ago, complications, got to be something like that. So I went to my computer and I started typing in, right? I went to like Mail Online and WebMD. I had like three of them up and I'm typing in my symptoms. <laughs> what time is this? This is like one in the morning, right? Right. And I'm typing all these things in and it comes up with you probably got a urinary tract infection. I'm like, well, that probably makes sense. And so then I thought, well, I got to write these symptoms down, but I was so weak, I couldn't. I couldn't even write, so I typed these symptoms out and then printed it out and went and woke Ginger up, who was in a state of panic then, because I'm waking her up at 1.30 in the morning. And actually, I had called the online health nurse first on my insurance, right? Call. Sure. The nurse said to me, um, you need to see a doctor within four hours. And I looked at the clock and I said, it's 1.30. She said, exactly. <laughs> I said, I got it. I'll go to the emergency room. I mean, I think she knew I was a resistant patient, right? So off we went to the emergency room. Yep, you have a urinary tract infection. This is what had happened. I had a diagnostic exam. I, was di I already knew I was diagnosed with prostate cancer. So I revealed that. And they gave me some medication to help with the infection as well as to help with the, the symptoms that you experience for any of you that particularly um, women are very familiar with urinary tract infections. Sure. Men, not so much. But, right. So they gave me medications to help with all of that. And they said within 24 hours, you start to feel a lot better. Well, 24 hours came and went, and by Monday morning, I was not feeling very well. And I was getting sicker by the hour. And by 3 in the afternoon, after Ginger had been on the phone with Dr. James' office a couple of times, I was nauseous. I was laying on the floor, shaking as if I was having epileptic seizures. Um, and my temperature had risen all the way to 105.5. So I thought you should come in. <laughs> I think. <laughs> I was right. And I, uh, I don't remember it, much from the experience. No, no, what no. I do remember is Dr. James looking at the room saying, he is not in a good place and he's not in the right place. Correct. And then I saw his arms come across the top of my body. I don't know what expression was, being, was coming off of Ginger's face. But I saw his arms come across my body and say, I got this. <laughs> so, I'm not sure what was happening. I was taking care of it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it just had to be resolved. It had to be, you had to be out of there and, and now. So we shot him over to the uh, ER and I talked to them and they admitted him and got him intra on intravenous antibiotics. He had a resistant organism. He isn't the kind of guy you would expect to have a resistant organism <laughs> from, well, I don't know. But at least from my perspective, he, has, he didn't have any of the things that would have qualified him. Today, we look at things a little more differently. Resistant organisms are more common today than they were 20 years ago. And that's, this is where we're getting these, this 1% to 3% uh, incidence of infection or sepsis. We didn't used to see this. Um, in fact, I didn't see it at all 20, 10, 20 years ago. We see it a few times a year now. We take precautions in those in whom we can anticipate. It just wasn't in the cards in this particular instance. And so he became septic. He went to the hospital, and they did, what did they do there, John? They did a CT scan, remember that? They did, yeah. They and, 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 and lo and behold, the CAT scan, you know, I normally don't do that for a urinary tract infection. Sometimes I do. It's okay. The ER doctor ordered the CAT scan, and what did it show us? And so they found a, a mass the size of a racquetball in my left kidney. In his kidney? So right. within six days, I was diagnosed with prostate cancer and then kidney cancer. Well, we didn't know until it was in the bucket, but right. you know, it, it, he had a real mass. That was diagnosed completely. There was no clue to that. So from bad things come good. We actually found something that we wouldn't have otherwise found. In fact, that wouldn't have been found eh, you know, at some point. Uh, at some point, yeah, but it could have been like quite a ways down, down the road. Mm -hmm. um, so a series of events, he got better from the infection, that took a while, but then um, underwent a partial nephrectomy. Yep. It was and a then, long summer. And then had a complication from the nephrectomy. Right, he had a little leak, because yep. it, it come through the collecting system and 
So there was a little leak, but you know, these things heal. So right. I had two surgeries in January related to the kidney. Yep. And then in March, uh, I think it was March 3rd, if I remember right, uh, that I had a, a prostatectomy. Right. Nerve sparing pros prostatectomy sure. was the intent. Um, but it had, it was uh, stage three. I was um, uh, Gleason's nine, ultimately. Yeah. Originally okay. eight, but a nine. Yeah. Um, so they had to take a lot of the surrounding tissue in the margins, and in fact, one, uh, the nerve sparing, the intention of the nerve sparing is to preserve those nerves, but one side, um, I lost most of the nerves on one side. Yeah. Uh, because it, it, the cancer had gotten out, so in order to harvest enough. Um, so we, we came through that, and then I started the road recovery in the spring and through the summer, and um, off we went. And because the disease was locally advanced, um, which you wouldn't have expected at this age with a PSA of three and a half. Uh, that was a bit of a surprise. I'll go on to that a little bit later, but um, the disease was locally advanced. He's young. We had to hit it with everything we had. So we used hormonal ablation. We took away the male hormone. And well, then, this was when it came back, though. Yeah, so, you're right. right. So we thought, we thought we were fine, but then in September, September 17th, I went in for my three-month checkups. Uh, because we'd done the we'd done the prostatectomy, they wanted to hit me with radiation. The immediate follow up. There's a name well, for that. Well, we were discussing when, if, and when to do it. Yeah, so, and I I had been so beat up from three surgeries and so worn down that I said, heal. I, yeah, I really don't want to go through radiation right. unless there's something that Clear. we know for sure is right. wrong. Right. So everybody agreed that's all right, but we're gonna we're gonna monitor you every three months. And so at my very first three month checkup, which was the only time Ginger couldn't make an appointment, which wasn't her, it was me, who said, it's not a big deal, it's my first three months, I'm gonna be just fine, it's gonna come back zero, don't worry about it. When it comes back, it's gonna be a couple of years. We could it'll be just fine, Ginger, don't worry about it. So she fought hard, but I had other commitments, and I was going to other places that day, and had a heavy travel schedule. I said, just go whip in, everything will be fine. Turns out it wasn't. The doctors had said to me ahead of time, it's okay if you, if we don't do anything right away, but if your PSA, and PSAs, I know they get maligned, I'm not the doctor, Dr. James can talk about, talk about that, but I know they get maligned on the front side, but on the back side, um, they're an excellent indicator of what's going on. And yeah. they said if it crosses point two, then you have to re-enter another round of treatment. Right. So that day, they said, here's the good news, your kidney cancer is in full remission. We don't want to see you for another year related to kidney cancer. Mm -hmm. Anyway, great. And then he turned the screen around on me and he said, but here's our problem. And it's at point four. And I said, well, that's twice of what you said it could be before we had to start treatment. He said, right, we have to start treatment right away. All right. So hormonal therapy, induction. We, with radiation, many times what we'll do is um, hit it with hormone therapy to weaken it and shrink it and then use radiation to kill it. Radiation therapy, the idea is to kill the cancer and the surrounding tissues, actually, around it to try and eradicate the cancer, weaken it, and kill it. And so that's what we did. Um, so, so that started in October, and we started with uh, anti-hormone therapy. Right, right. Lupron, and, yeah, Lupron. And as of April 1st, I self-declared myself treatment-free because my last shot was on March 1st, it's 30 days. Yeah. So I haven't started sweating yet while I've been up here, but it could. I could still have the residual effects of the hot flashes and fatigue and other sorts of things, but that hopefully will wear off by the end of this month. And in December and January, I went through 38 um, straight days, rounds of radiation therapy. Um, and my radiation was um, typical radiation on the prostate bed, which is normal. But again, because of the aggressive nature of my prostate cancer, um, as Dr. James said, we wanted to hit it with everything we possibly could, right. which we refer to as the kitchen sink, but that meant radiating my pelvic lymph system. So, and there are lots of complications, potential dangers with that, and we sure. to all the way to lymphedema, of course, in the lower limb system. But it was really the best way to try to make sure we were doing everything we could at a young age with an aggressive form of prostate cancer to do everything we could right now to try to do what we could set it way back. So that's what we did, and it took 38 rounds. And, um, and so that's where I'm at now, and we won't retest. Yeah, we won't retest to know until June. That'll be the first retest. But because of the way the prostate cancer works and its life cycle and the hormone therapies and everything else, we really won't know for sure if it's in remission until about the spring. Yeah, you know, next and year. cancer is, um, people live with cancer. We have cancer survivals. We have all these little words we use, NED, 
That's one of my favorites, yeah. right? And I remember no, when I was NED June yeah, last I year. Ned. Yeah. I just love Ned. Yep. No one is disease, you know. And, and but things tend to change as time goes by. Um, so we're hoping you're Ned for ever. Right. Yeah. I, I'm one of those, you know, everybody's got different views about cancer. I'm a survivor, right? And right. you are the day you're diagnosed, you're you're a cancer survivor, right? I, I'm I'm one of the those people that I don't necessarily believe that you get cured. Right, but you treat it. And and hopefully as we go through these treatments, I got a better chance of dying from so many other things than I do of either of these cancers. Right. And that's okay. I'm absolutely comfortable with that. I'm proud of the fact that I'm a survivor and we've treated it and it's in remission. We don't know about the prostate cancer yet. We'll learn. We have to be patient with that. And by the way, those numbers could go up. And if they go up, and the cancer, the problem with prostate cancer is it could be anywhere in my body. Right. And that's where the anti-hormone therapy becomes important because right. it can suppress it anywhere. So the radiation might not have treated where it might be manifesting itself at the moment and it could come back. Well, and, and of course, if, if it does come back, we've got strategies. We got more. We got more strategies. I mean, what we've talked about here so far is diagnosis and management of localized disease. Tonight I'm not going to talk much about metastatic disease, but a lot of what you're hearing out there, the special studies up at the U and at Mayo, a lot of these are for advanced <coughs> disease, people who've gone through these steps and are now in need of something greater, some systemic treatment. Um, this is where the, the, the newest things are. They're way over, well actually some of it's over my head, believe it or not. Uh, but it, it's, you know, it's new university setting, uh, uh, clinical trials. A couple of caveats and things I'm going I'm to pedal back a little bit because we, we talked at the beginning about the PSA and the PSA has been under a lot of heat um, the last couple of years. Uh, I think it's been, in the press, I think it's been, I think it's been maligned somewhat unfairly. It's a simple blood test and nothing more. It's a simple blood test that tells you something about your prostate as opposed to knowing nothing. And so I think it's a test that's worth it. I think it's worth it for men in their 40s. I think a, a baseline study gives you some idea of where you are. And I often tell people um, that the insurance company has a lot of faith in the PSA. If you go get life insurance right now, they're going to get a PSA on you. And the reason is, their actuaries tell you it's a good idea. They would know. They're the numbers people. So if, if the insurance people think it's a good idea, I think it's a good idea. So I think people should get their PSAs. That doesn't mean there aren't errors. There are false positives. There are false negatives. I mean, that's true of any test. And as patients, and you know, we have to keep that in mind of, of any test. You know, if you get 20 tests, one of them is going to be abnormal statistically. Well, my PSA, I mean, the, right. the baseline for the medical community was at 4.0. It depends on who you ask, you know. I mean, and some I people say there. 4, some people say 2.5, some people use age-specific, some people say the test is worthless. Yeah. You know, so I mean, it, it really depends on who you ask. But I, from my perspective, I think it's still a very valuable thing. And even the digital exam, it, you know, Dr. James said, I feel something very small, but it could be an infection. It could be a calcium deposit stone. But the only way we're really going to know is to do this diagnostic exam. And you do have risk factors with this elevation and age and a father, etc. So we ought to do it. So as guys, right, I mean, as a message about what we need to know about our own health is that, yes, we're generally resistant until our leg is sliced wide open and there's blood spurting. We feel like we don't need to go to the doctor because we're invincible. It's not true, right? We need to go get medical care. We need to grow up sooner than I did at the age of 45. A lot of you in here are older than me, but I'm your son. I'm your son-in-law, right? And they might be my age. I'm, I'll be 49 this summer, but remember, I was diagnosed at 47, and chances are that kidney cancer had started inside of me at, they think, maybe around the age of 40, right? It was growing for 8 to 10 years, so this stuff happens to young people, too, and I'm, I am that face. I, you know, my dad's the face of prostate cancer to me. I'm not the face of prostate cancer, but now I am. And, and I'm happy to embrace that, to sound that along for everybody. Sure. Because it's, it's treatable. It's not, you know, the experience for me, I'm going on 18 months and I'm not done. Um, and there's, there's still testing to be done. There's still recovery for me. There are changes in my life after the, the surgeries. You know, I just came back from Florida. 
Uh, when I was on the radio last week, I said I was down there for therapy, right? I went down to play golf, something I hadn't done. I hadn't been on a guy's golf trip for 18 months. I didn't know a year ago when I was laying in the hospital after my prostatectomy, it was hard for me to imagine to be able to spin my body and swing a golf club with all the surgery I had, right? So I didn't know if I could ever get back to that. So part of this was, can I do that? And then after the radiation, you know, somebody asked me today what my diet was. I think it was Cecily, we were talking about that. And I said, in the middle of radiation, I got down to pretty much just chicken, fish, and baby food. It's pretty good, by the way. Today's good. It's in the little pouches, all kinds of flavors. It's actually pretty tasty. So that's what I got down to, and I'm still trying to bring my diet back. This week I had uh, homemade spaghetti for the first time. Red sauce, you know, I haven't had that in a long time. Did okay, right? I ate a half an apple yesterday. I hadn't had a whole fruit for a really long time. So there are changes, and I, I'm forever changed because of the surgeries on my midsection, the radiation that I've had. Dr. James even reminded me a couple of nights ago, I'm still in the acute phase. My internal organs are still swollen and irritated from the radiation. I didn't think they were, because I'm back to working out as hard as I ever have at the line in the morning, swimming as fast as I ever did, going on a golf trip, right? Spending my days the way I normally spent them, and then he had to remind me, you know, you're still in the right. acute phase. Oh yeah, I, I tell the fellas that all the time. Especially in this day of minimally invasive surgery, people don't understand that they've been monkey with. And it takes, it still takes six, 12 months, it, you know, for this to heal. And then it takes a while for this to heal, too. And you know, you know, I, it just does. There's all those issues with um, incontinence, urinary incontinence, right? My father um, still struggles with that a little bit. Um, I had to experience all the levels of the pads during the process, but I, I have great control. You know, the muscular issues here, right? Guys, we have two muscles, yeah. and you lose one during the prostatectomy, so there's only one muscle holding the dam back now, right? <laughs> so, urgencies, etc., are there, but um, I, don't, I don't have any issues with that anymore. And the younger guys usually do very well. Right. I mean, that's if, you know, they don't tend to have as much trouble. Right. Which is why we steer away from radical surgery in, in older fellows. Yes. Just, you know, we use other methods by and large. And the radiation um, had the potential for uh, an additional lymphedema, which we'll st keep, still keep an eye on, uh, incontinence from a bowel perspective, too, that can develop. Now, that was probably the most frightening for me. I'm an active guy right. that needs to stay active, do these types of things, and the concept that I might not be able to stand in front of a room anymore because I might need to run to the restroom quick was just terrifying for me. Yeah. But... I've overcome that, right? And so I'm good. And they they said there is a chance you can get back to baseline. And to my perspective, I'm I'm back to probably whatever my baseline is going to be. There's a normalcy there, but my body functions a little different, and I'm learning what normal looks like. But I don't have restrictions, and I can get on an airplane and fly for four hours like I did, and yeah. everything was fine. The guy sitting next to me who was actually having a cocktail had to get up and go to the bathroom more than I did, <laughs> right? So. There, there are those changes. You know, Dr. James asked me about sexual function, right? I mean, I had a nerve sparing surgery, but I lost half of that. So the types of things that you hear about from erectile dysfunction, etc., those things are real. Um, and you face those. But, you know, um, Ginger and I are past that age of fathering and mothering children. Those aren't our issues. And in the middle of this, um, I learned that I love my wife even more. That those things sometimes just get in the way. And that's, the, that's this part. Right. Fixing the head and the heart the right way. Right. Um, and so you just, you learn to adapt differently in life, and uh, it's about the fact that you're still alive, and what you're going to do with the moments that you are alive. Not about what got taken away, it's about what you have now, right? It's about appreciating that, so it's, cancer's going to change your life, there's no right. doubt about it, whatever you go through. But I'm blessed, I have an incredible, an incredible medical team. Uh, of people, and it started with Dr. Berg and Dr. James, and I've been so well taken care of. And as a patient, I had to do my part, and I also learned the importance of a caregiver. Um, you can't do it without a caregiver, um, somebody in your life that takes care of you, that oh, yeah. is that other set of eyes and ears. Oh yeah. And then this community, you know, you introduced me in the way you did, and thank you for the applause. But this community has embraced and supported me, and so you've all given me reason to work as hard as I have to try to get back to who I was and become even more, even better than what I was before cancer. So what are you going to do next, Jonathan? I'm going to keep talking about it. What are you going to do next? <laughs> what are you going to do next? 
Because that really is right. It's like, what do you want to do with the rest of your life? Right. It's one of those turning moments, you know, where you, it's a pivotal moment where you begin to say, what should I do with the rest of this? And it gives you, gives you focus. And for me, I just, I want to keep telling the story. I want to keep answering questions for people. I want to, uh, cancer's, it's not comfortable. And yes, it's scary, but um, I want to be an example of, of um, how you can get to the other side, survive, and come out even stronger. And if people have questions, you know, if they, they want me to talk to somebody, uh, part of my personal mission in life is to make a difference on people, not just communities, but people. And so I have a purpose that's beyond just the work that I do. It's about this life and the fact that I'm on the other side of this and still fighting and still grappling and still dealing with it. But I'm here to be as helpful as I can to anyone that faces these types of journeys, and I want to be available for that. Should we take a question or two? Has anybody right. got anything they want to ask? Either one of us? That's easy. Good. Come on. We answered all our questions. Yeah. 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 Cash, right? Yeah, cash. How about that? In, in, the, uh, in your next life, I think you should be a coach. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Anything else? Yes, sir. So did you have surgery and did you have the prostate removed or not? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, uh, prostatectomy full. Do we call it a radical? What yeah. do we call yeah. it? Yeah, radical retributive prostatectomy. Okay. So yeah. I took the whole thing out. Sure. Yep, it's all gone. Some of the tissue around it. Yeah. Yeah. So what's the thing about bicycles now, right? Like, I still haven't gotten on a traditional bicycle. I ride a recumbent at the Y in the morning, but the one with the thing going through the The one's bad. Yeah, they have, most of these guys already know this. It, they make these seats where the middle isn't, there's no pressure on your prostate. It's the one I need. Yeah, it is. Me too. Yeah. And all of you. I mean, it's just otherwise, the, those old, English saddles, do you remember those? They don't work. They just don't work. They're not for us. So they're not for us. We, uh, Even a guy like me, I asked him to tell him, can I get on a bike? He said, don't get on one of those. Don't get on one of those. He said, but it's gone. What does it matter? He said, well, you have a lot of surgery there. Because <laughs> when, they, when they take the prostate out, you know, they cut out a piece of the urethra. Yeah, the whole, the whole thing. You know, and then they got to pull it. Yeah. Stitch it back together. Put it, yeah, pull it together and stitch it. Yeah. So you don't want to. You don't want to hurt that. And that, that by the way, yeah, that, that was, you know, that was the most enlightening thing that you go in, uh, what are we going, 10 days later, seven, 10 days later after the prostatectomy and you've got, you know, you got a, a catheter. catheter, right? And so they remove that thing and make sure that it's healed and you don't have a leak. And then they give you your Bert Nernie's right. diapers. Diapers, right, to come home. Now it's from Rochester to here, so just try to stop every 30 minutes after something like that, right? And then, uh, uh, what was it, two weeks later? Two weeks later, I had tremendous abdominal pain. I developed a lot of abdominal adhesions from all the surgeries that I had. And, and we didn't know that at the time, what was going on, but I had tremendous abdominal pain. And I ended up in the ER about two weeks later. And this was absolutely the most painful experience. I, they were giving me morphine every half hour. They thought maybe I had sprung a leak, but that stitching had sprung a leak. So they had to recatheterize. Oh, yeah. Five nurses in a room at 2.30 in the morning. Now, I've been through a lot. Didn't matter to me who was in the room, right? And they grab a garden hose. <laughs> and that's what they're going to recatheterize me. They did. Wow. Was that painful? No, that's exciting. No leak. No. I had no leak, but it was the abdominal adhesions that you know, we had to understand and learn about and deal with. But that was probably one of the most painful things I went through was getting recatheterized. Because all the other catheters happened when I was in surgery. Right. I went through some of that myself on the cancer part, but uh, when you get catheterized for a few days, it, you know, it, uh, it's quite an adjustment when it comes out. Uh, when you have a nurse take it out for you, she says, I'm going to let the fluid out of the ball. And she says, I'll count to three, and you take a deep breath, and it feels like a bowling ball. <laughs> it is painful. Yeah, it does, not, it does not feel good at all. Yeah. And after that one that they had to redo for me, um, then it felt like I was you know, going to the bathroom through glass for about 10 days. It was just terrible. Yes, ma'am. I, I remember as a registered nurse, uh, some guy, he was uh, kind of you know, in his he was just kind of, um, I don't know if he was kind of strung out with medication or he was having a nightmare, but boy, he swore that that was a snake down there. <laughs> he was pulling on it. He's got the ball, you know, with the fluid in the 
It's amazing what our bodies go through. Right, yeah. Right. Sorry we have to do these things, but you know how it is. Yes, next. Jonathan, I know you have ginger, but did you, how, did you, how else did you deal with depression? You know, um, I, I saw the, you know, I was in the low T conversation. <coughs> and uh, because, because my hormones were stopped, right, uh, my testosterone was stopped, I experienced a lot of those pieces. But the one on the list that I really didn't experience was, I, I don't, there were very few times I ever noticed even a mood swing, and depression was not something that, that visited me. Now for me, for me, part of that I believe is my faith. Uh, that's, that's my bedrock. Second is, those of you that know me in any way, shape, or form know that I'm a pretty energized guy. Uh, I'm pretty enthusiastic. Third, I never let myself get cut off from all that was important to me. So I worked virtually. Uh, in the confines of our home, uh, when I needed to, I made small appearances when I could, uh, but I was in direct conversation with my team all the time at work and made it really clear to them that I'll decide, don't, don't protect me, let me tell you when I can't do something, and I did, I had to live up to my side of it, but they didn't cut me out. In fact, during that entire time, I never let go of the responsibilities that were purely mine. Every two weeks, I still approved payroll. Even in the middle of all those surgeries, it timed out perfect that I never had to miss those opportunities. So part of it for me was staying connected to what, what was important and what was purposeful for me. Um, so if you back that up, along with just my general nature, which really probably comes from my bedrock again, which is my deep, my deep faith and my trust in God. And so um, for me as a Christian, that, that was where it all started. Um, so it's a great question. Thank you. Those issues are um, very germane. I mean, that the anxiety and depression that go along with going through this, either for you and sometimes it's the spouse. Yes. You know, it may not be or your mother. I mean, you don't really know uh, your kids. My brother. Your brother. My brother. Yeah, exactly. Was probably the individual we had the most trouble figuring out. Sure. Mm -hmm. He seemed rocked by this in a way that I've never experienced, and I could not figure him out. But I think he was—I think he was struggling with the older brother syndrome as well as why is this happening to my younger brother? And not sure, me? sure. And of course, his, so prostate, his prostate cancer risk is skyrocketed as well. So I mean, from his—it may have been—he was thinking this is a harbinger of things to come. You know, maybe part of that, and the vulnerability of his little brothers is real. You know, that doesn't seem right. So there's a lot of these things that get thrown that can precipitate anxiety and, and depression. But this guy didn't have that. I mean, and I, I, he's absolutely right. He, he had the foundations intact to weather this storm. Yeah. There was a, a little here. Is it always possible to do your sparing? How long has that been done? Yeah. Um, radical prostatectomy was, has been done since the <laughs> 20s. Hugh Hampton Young, the godfather of urology. <laughs> In the 1980s, um, uh, Pat Walsh at uh, Hopkins developed the nerve sparing radical prostatectomy. Now, uh, in the last 10 to 15 years, we've done robotic prostatectomies. And the robotics, what's nice about robotics is there's less blood loss, and you can see the neurovascular bundles better, okay? But not everybody's a candidate. Most of the people that are candidates for nerve sparing are people who have PSA identified prostate cancers who have normal exams. You know, today we're not doing the PSAs that we used to. So we're sort of losing that window. That doesn't mean there aren't treatment options for people with um, more locally advanced diseases. There are. And not everybody needs a radical prostatectomy. Some people can be treated with uh, cryosurgical ablation. We can freeze it. Some people are treated with radiation therapy alone. Some people are treated with brachytherapy. Some people don't need to be treated at all. You know, there are some people with low-grade cancers in certain age groups that don't need to be treated. It's a complicated discussion, and there's a lot of confusion about who, what, where, and how. So the only thing I can say is, yes, we still do that. Some people are great candidates. It's just hard to know for any given individual you know, what's best for you. That's a very personal thing.
It's all very patient specific. Absolutely. I mean, Everybody's well, cancer is different. A lot of those things that Dr. James read, well, none of those were options for me. Correct. In part, as I understood it, because of my age uh, and also because of the aggressive nature of my cancer. That's correct. Um, so, and also because of my age, I was a good candidate for some other options too. Right. And so a lot of those, the long list of options, it became very patient specific. And yep. so that is how it goes. Factors. That is how it goes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Here's one. A couple of them. John is a, he's a tough young pup. What about if somebody is 83 years old, what is watchful waiting then? What are you waiting for? And then what? <laughs> That's a really good question. Uh, what yeah, what are you waiting for? I, I mean, I, I agree with that. Part of it is, in Minnesota, we live a long time, for better or worse. You know, uh, we live longer than, I think Hawaii is the only other state, right, where they, so the, I always ask the question is, you know, I try to look at a fella and say, what are your chances of surviving another 10 years? We all say we're gonna live to be 100. I tell all guys, you really don't wanna be 100. <laughs> but but that's, that's another discussion <laughs> entirely, isn't it? But, um, but you know, 10 years, what are your chances of living 10 years? If you have a chance of living 10 years and your disease is localized, my perspective is try and take care of it, okay? Now that's a, are, then are you willing to put up with some of the problems that can result from doing these things, whether it's freezing or radiation? You know, in men that we observe, what it, many times the point here is that they will not live long enough to have a complication and in particular die of their disease. Okay. What we don't want to see is people dying of prostate cancer. And one of the things that's really frustrating for me it, it, is as we've moved away from PSA, the people who are most likely to die with and from prostate cancer are men that are 70 and up. They have the highest incidence of cancer and they're most likely to die of it. So it kind of makes sense you should test them. And yet, you know, if you listen to some people, they say you shouldn't. I disagree with that. I think watchful waiting really has its place. What you're saying, though, is you have a diagnosis. You know, at the point at which, you know, you know what your PSA is, you know if your exam is normal or abnormal, you know whether you have metastatic disease or you don't, all this has been explained to you, you can decide how aggressive you want to be. I have men with metastatic disease that we're watching. You know, that not everybody wants hormone therapy. You 75. You know, they feel fine, they, so we watch it, and the point at which, for, it depends on the case, but when the disease or the PSA is changing exponentially, you know, it's going up, like then we hit it. And a lot of the fellows these days, we use intermittent hormone therapy. So to try and avoid the long-term sequela of complete antigen ablation, taking away the male hormone, we'll use it intermittently. So we, we do that a lot, we customize it. There was another question. Yeah. yeah does a vasectomy have any uh, impact on an hormonal therapy? Did you say vasectomy? Yeah. No. Uh, that's, there was uh, about 20 years ago, there was some talk about vasectomy and prostate cancer being having a correlate. And what it turned out to be was that men who had a vasectomy, by and large, had higher um, health care. In other words, if you had the money for a vasectomy, you probably had the money for a PSA, and you probably had a doctor. And so these men actually had a higher incidence of prostate cancer, but had nothing to do with their vasectomy. So that's how correlations, you gotta be so careful. But yeah, that's a, that was a good one. All right, and he has one more. One more. Yeah, well, that's a warming testimony there, Thank you. The early signs, now there's a, uh, protocol is followed for you to even get into the MD and then the MD has to refer you to the urinologist. And, uh, that protocol there, is there, is there any early signs or any homopathic uh, approaches you can have just to get comfortable while you're waiting to see the doctors? Well, I, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with that. Um, I think, I'm not sure exactly what you mean about getting in. I don't think people have too much trouble getting in to see us, do they? Or your family doc? I, I mean, so I'm not sure, you know, exactly whether the, you're talking about the insurance end of it or 
No, uh, the process, you can't just, uh, in the Mayo Clinic's, uh, my understanding of the Mayo Clinic, uh, their process, you can't just say, hey, I want to see you now. Just yeah, I can't speak for them. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, so I'm not, I don't know exactly. We don't see, I don't think we have that problem. At least not at the Mankato Clinic, I don't. We have pretty open access as far as that's concerned. Yeah, go ahead. Are there other tests that, uh, besides the PSA, sure. uh, just to let yeah. us know what they are? What are some of the new things? I didn't talk about that. That um, There are a number of new tests that are coming out. Most of them are variations on the PSA. Um, we've been doing some of these for a while. Um, there's a, a three set of PSA-related uh, tests that are being done. It's not readily available. We don't have it in this part of the country. We do have free PSA. Um, and there are some additional tests that we do in association with prostatic exam um, that may be a little bit better. But if we don't really have the, the holy grail of, of prostate blood tests. I mean, that we really don't have anything. The problem with the PSA is that it's neither specific nor is it sensitive as much as we'd like it to be, meaning that there are false positives and false negatives. So I don't have anything that's brand new there. In terms of uh, diagnosis, um, prostatic MRI is, is on the horizon, where we do magnetic resonance imaging of the prostate, particularly in men in whom we haven't been able to find it with the more conservative ways. But these are expensive modalities. I mean, and so at the same time that you know, insurance companies and all of us are trying to look at healthcare costs. We got a great test, but nobody can afford it. Is that is the prosthetic MRI the one that I would have had prior to to my surgeries? Were they mm, no, you, rectal enhancements and it images? The yeah, that, they talked about it. Oh, that's miserable. <laughs> but you haven't had it. I had that twice. But you didn't have a prostate MRI. Absolutely. Okay, yeah, but, they, but they yeah, anesthesia. Oh, that might gosh. be a good idea. But well, it's, it's good vision. -y. Yeah, don't think about it. Let's know where they're going. Yeah, forget about it. <laughs> you know, there's the things we have to do to try right. to improve. Exactly. Improve. You know, what we have is actually pretty good, yeah. by and large. So. Buy one more.